Welcome back, kids. We're going to pick up with Lesson 11 for Blood on the River. Today, you're going to need your response journal to jot down some important information that you can use later this week, and your vocab journal since we're going to define a couple new vocabulary words. So last week, we talked about Reverend Hunt's impact on Samuel, and this week, we're going to talk about Captain Smith's impact on him. We're going to define some new vocabulary, and we're going to experiment with reasons or claims, evidence, and elaboration more thoroughly this week. So before you kick off on this lesson, you will need to have read chapters 23, 24, and 25 of Blood on the River, which you can do on Schoology under Readings Module 3 or listen to it on the YouTube channel. We're going to analyze how Captain Smith positively impacts Samuel and influences his perspectives, beliefs, and values. We're going to add words to our vocab journal, and we're going to identify and explain how textual evidence shows the influence that Captain Smith has had on Samuel. So let's get those vocab journals out. We're going to add two words. Coming up is going to be a really good time to pause to make sure that you have these two new vocabulary words written down. The first word we have for today is servitude. In the chapters we just read, Captain Smith releases Samuel from servitude, which basically means slavery. He works for Captain Smith, but he doesn't get paid, and he doesn't have a choice on whether or not he can quit. Samuel now has a chance to choose his own life's path, though, and not be forced to serve a potentially crueler master than Captain Smith. The second word that I have for you is what Samuel eventually becomes, which is an apprentice. Captain Smith makes Samuel John Layden's apprentice. That's a person who works for someone else to gain skills or to learn about their business. Samuel has always viewed John Layden as a decent man, and now he can learn even more valuable skills and become a carpenter in his own right. He's adding to his skill set by learning under John Layden and becoming good at carpentry, which is working with wood. So let's review. What are some new and ongoing social and environmental factors in chapters 23 through 25 that are causing problems for the Jamestown settlement? Let's start with environmental, since there are much fewer environmental factors than social factors. There are too many settlers to feed, and the threat of a food shortage is yet again a problem that the settlers are facing. Starvation is a real concern, especially since they haven't been able to trade with the Native Americans since the Native Americans are now their enemy. Like I said, there are way more social factors. One of them is that there is conflict once again between Captain Smith and the gentlemen as they struggle against each other for power. Captains Archer and Ratcliffe have returned to Jamestown, and they tell Captain Smith that he is to step down as president. The new colonists that have come back with them don't respect Smith because men such as Ratcliffe have poisoned their minds. When Captain Smith tells them that they need to respect the Native Americans and that the delicate relationship between the settlers and their neighbors is very important, the new colonists decide to ignore his advice. That, of course, causes more conflict between the settlers and the Native Americans. The new colonists think that they're superior to the native people. This, as we know, is a huge problem because the new colonists have no respect for the Native Americans and they violently attack them without even stopping to think about the consequences that that could have on the Jamestown settlement. This is a huge problem. We talked about the environmental factor that starvation is a real threat, but a social factor is that not enough settlers are working to make sure that the group has enough food supplies. They're not working to provide for each other. This is a social problem. Just being plain greedy is another social factor. More colonists are coming to Jamestown with the dream of finding gold, which, by the way, they have found exactly none so far. These settlers don't understand the reality of living in the New World, which is to have shelter, food, and peaceful relationships with their neighbors. They're too focused on getting rich to take care of themselves. In chapter 24, what is Samuel's perspective about the way the new colonists are interacting with the Native Americans? How does his perspective mirror Captain Smith's about this new factor that threatens Jamestown? Samuel, very much like Captain Smith, believes that the new colonists are ignorant and that they are truly the savages because they have no hearts and they don't care about their new neighbors. They're dismissive and they act superior to the Native Americans, and this causes loads of problems. Samuel can see that the new colonists don't have the depth of understanding and that they're not willing to try to make relationships with their neighbors, and this is going to put them in a very dangerous position. 
Just like Captain Smith, Samuel knows that the delicate relationship with the Native Americans requires trade and work to keep a fragile peace. The settlers cannot survive without the help of the Native Americans, and they can't survive if the Native Americans are their enemy. They need this relationship in order to be well-fed, to be protected. Basically, for the colony to endure at all, they need to have a good relationship with the Native population. When Captain Smith discovers that some of the new colonists have burned the natives' houses and beat the people with clubs and shot at them with muskets, he knows that this is a very dangerous position that they're in. He yells at them, Are you trying to start out an all-out war with the natives, with 10,000 of them and a few hundred of us? Are you insane? Captain Smith knows that war will result in the destruction of the colony. And if all of the native population stands up against them, there is no way that they will survive. Speaking of Captain Smith, today we're going to focus on Captain Smith's impact on Samuel's development and growth. And we're going to collect and consider evidence that captures Smith's influence on him, just like we did last week with Reverend Hunt. This is going to culminate or make up a two-seek paragraph response where you're going to write to show the impact that Captain Smith has had on Samuel using evidence from the text to support your claims. So, what are some things that Captain Smith has taught Samuel over the course of the book so far? For one thing, Captain Smith has taught Samuel how to be brave by encouraging him to take a chance and learn new things. He doesn't beat Samuel when he first fails at cleaning the sword when they're in the Caribbean. He continues to teach him that trying is an act of bravery, like when he teaches Samuel how to sword fight. That was really frightening for him, but it's also a skill that he's really benefited from having. Samuel goes from believing that he's unteachable to believing that he is teachable, and this change results from Samuel having the courage to learn new things, which Captain Smith introduced him to. Captain Smith has also taught Samuel how to channel his anger rather than letting it control him. Smith has modeled this behavior for him many times when the gentlemen are unfair or cruel to him. He never flies off and starts yelling and breaking things. He's always very methodical. He's calm. He works through being angry and tries to find a common ground. And Samuel sees this and then practices channeling his anger rather than using his fists to solve his problems. Smith talks to him about this directly, but he also models this behavior so that Samuel can see that it has an active benefit. Perhaps most importantly for being a stranger in a strange land, Captain Smith has taught Samuel to treat the Native Americans as people, not as savages. Samuel has copied this behavior and attitude, and it's opened up his mind and his heart to the Native population. He has Native friends in Namontak and with the other tribe that he goes to live with. He learns so much from them about how he can protect his own people. He values and appreciates their customs, and he learns their language almost to the point of being totally fluent. Captain Smith models this behavior that these people, though different from them, are exactly that, people. They're not strange. They're not savages. They're just people, and he can learn so much from them. This is a huge benefit because it shows that Captain Smith is open-minded and that he prioritizes treating other people well and passes this character trait on to Samuel. Are you getting sick of two seek paragraphs yet? I completely understand. But just think of how impressed your seventh grade teachers are gonna be that you can write a whole paragraph using evidence that explains your point. So your task for this week, I know I'm sure that makes you feel much better, is to skim the novel and find one example of Captain Smith impacting Samuel in a positive way that shapes his development. This is very similar to your prompt from last week about Reverend Hunt, except this time it's Captain Smith. I have given you your claim to start off your response. Captain Smith impacts Samuel in a positive way and helps him grow as a person because... You're going to write this directly on Google Docs. So, you're going to have a topic sentence. That's your claim. I've given it to you. You will use evidence. You can use evidence from anywhere in the text. It doesn't just have to be these chapters. But it's going to be a quote from the text. You can use page numbers from the online book. You should use page numbers from the online book. Then you will elaborate, so you'll write a sentence that explains how your quote proves that Captain Smith has impacted Samuel positively, and then you'll write a conclusion statement which restates your claim. This is how, or this is why, Captain Smith has impacted Samuel in a positive way. As always, 
These should be in complete sentences with no vague pronouns, and you must use quotations from the text as your evidence. You can write this directly on the Google Docs that's listed on Schoology, and it will be due on Sunday at midnight. We're coming up on the end of the term, so we're getting close to the end here. Please make sure that you're getting your work in, and if you have missing work, to try and get that submitted to me too. As always, if you have questions, comments, concerns, leave me a comment on this video, leave me a comment on Schoology, or shoot me an email. You can also come to my Zoom meetings on Tuesday, and I am more than willing to help you in any way that I can. We miss you very much, and I will have your next lesson up for you on Thursday.